when america raises interest rates the results overseas is overwhelmingly inflation because those countries have to hold on to dollars kind of like how uh, people who hold bitcoin or they they refer to them as holders and so you have these people that hold on to the currency and the only reason that they hold on to the currency is because in the global market and this is why it was very smart of what the united of what the united states did to further in debt nations and so people look at the disruption of the supply chain as an after effect the result of the pandemic is the breakdown of the supply chain. And I say the purpose of the pandemic was to break down the supply chain. And what it would do is it would cause nations who relied on the dollar to go out and buy commodities, to go out and buy oil, natural gas, coal, wheat, etc. To have to pay more as America at that time where the supply the where the supply chain is broken floods the economies with dollars causing inflation and of course the countries that can produce the most end up hoarding those dollars and then many of these smaller countries are left in poverty and argentina is an example now of course argentina foolishly took on the european style of a welfare state and of course, a welfare state requires you to rob from one group of people to pay for another group of people. And in the process of that, it causes you to increase the amount of currency you have in your country, thereby creating inflation in your currency. The problem is, in Argentina, nobody wants the Argentine peso. So, those, so the currency stays inside the country. And so it causes inflation inside the country and the more argentina countries like argentina have to do that the faster you get inflation now the reason america can do it is because america exports inflation they are an importer while countries like argentina africa mexico are exporters they export their serve their goods and what they receive are dollars and america exports dollars and what they receive our goods and so this is why america can create all of this inflation it goes out into the global economy and then it causes inflation in their country because now for these countries to be able to get those dollars they have to print more of their currency because they don't have dollars and this is what's happening to argentina as argentina is this, this is an article from reuters dated from september 5th talking about agonizing the divorce and of course they're talking about making the the dollar the national currency as it says here this is a <clears throat> talking about a woman who buys pesos peso currency is now in the crosshairs as the central bank is considering um dollarizing the economy not de-dollarizing the economy they are dollarizing the economy it's important to understand all currencies all other currencies are derivatives of the dollar and so for america to create debt and give an interest rate it doesn't matter because an interest rate is just a derivative of the of the interest rate is just a derivative of the asset right which is the which is the debt that is created and then america can create that debt out of thin air and they can also create the interest payment out of thin air so it, it doesn't really matter to the united states how much debt they accumulate it's more of the mental game to other countries this is all a ponzi scheme this is probably one of the biggest scams in all of human history as it goes on to this, this person says i try to go on to state this is just talking about how the currency had collapsed in argentina i try to buy dollars this is a woman in argentina who takes her paper currency her argentine dollar and at that time, it took 2,000 pesos to buy $10. Now she says that same 2,000 only buys her $2.70. So that's a lot of inflation. And it says the peso goes like water and every day it becomes worth less. And so you have supporters of 
one of the politicians running in Argentina, he's running as a libertarian. And of course, the guy's an idiot. He's more than likely a puppet. And he believes, of course, that by adopting the dollar, that he's going to somehow limit, uh, he's, he's going to somehow limit the inflation. The problem is he doesn't control getting access to the dollar unless, of course, he completely sells his country into slavery. That's the only way that they would be able to adopt a dollar is if they, in essence, become like a colony of the United States, kind of like Puerto Rico. And they would have to, in essence, enslave themselves even more so to America. And so this is what's happening to many countries. And this is, in essence, what China has been doing. And so China takes the dollars that they hold and America gets cheap labor from China. And in exchange for cheap labor, um, America ex you know, buys a lot from China. And then China takes those dollars and then it expands overseas into poor countries. There's Chinese loans pushing world's poorest countries to the brink of collapse. As it says, a dozen poor countries are facing economic instability and even collapse under the weight of hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign loans. And this is as of May 2023. Much of them come from the world's biggest unforgiving government, China. So countries like Pakistan, Kenya, uh, Zambia, Laos, Mongolia are heavily indebted to China. And of course, for them to be able to pay back these loans, and these loans are in dollars. So they have to go out and either create inflation in their country to buy dollars, which will just end up like this woman, right? It'll just end up like this woman who used to take 2,000 pesos to buy $10, and now the 2,000 pesos only buys $2.70. So that's option A for many of these countries. And option B is that they have to be willing to sell their commodities, what they produce in their country, for pennies on the dollar. And of course, this results in poverty. So in either direction that the country goes, the countries become impoverished over time. And so this is what you get in this in this economy there was an article that i saw i wonder if i have it open where it said over the course from i think it was from 1960 that western countries in essence robbed uh western countries robbed southern countries to an estimated 160 trillion dollars worth of wealth how did they do that they exchanged their hard assets of commodities goods and services for bills that they created out of thin air. And so and so this is how and why much of the debt is really irrelevant is really irrelevant because even if countries actually try to just do business on their own, America would eventually have to deliver democracy to these nations in the form of bombing the shit out of them. And so this is why I say that for the people, the people experience socialism within their country as their governments are typically forced to create more of the currency to go out and buy dollars those dollars and assets the assets the you know the businesses etc are held by a very small amount of people as you can see even within the united states right you can see here it says the wealthiest 10 percent of american households now own 89 percent of all u.s stocks a record high that highlights the inequality and what did the pandemic produce and this is why i say the purpose of the pandemic was to rob nations as it says here's the top one percent gained over 6.5 trillion in corporate equities and mutual fund wealth during the pandemic and this is according to the federal reserve so where did all that money go that was printed people were like the government printed trillions of dollars. Where did it go? More, most of it, overwhelmingly, went to the people who control the assets. The people who control the assets at the top. The people that run all these governments. The people that run all these governments. It's a very small group of people. And this is why the stock market doesn't fall, despite everything that's going on. You really don't see the stock market react in any way shape or form because it's a ponzi scheme overwhelmingly all the liquidity 
is held at the top. And so what actually trades on the New York Stock Exchange or on any stock exchange for that matter in, in the West is a very small percentage. It's 10% or less of the actual number of stocks, shares that are available to sell actually trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And you can see it from here, right? So the company Pfizer, on any given day, over the past three months, the stock only trades about 22.5 million shares. And over the course, the average of the past 10 days, it's been about 30 million shares. But how many shares actually exist? It's 4.2 billion, right? So if we were to take a calculator to kind of to see what percentage of stock is actually available on the stock exchange, for example, for like a company like Pfizer. And so if you've got 30 million, we'll just say, even though it's the past 10 days, we'll just say we take a 30 million and we'll divide it by the number of outstanding shares, which is 4.2 billion, right? So you got 4.2 billion shares divided by well, 30 million shares and we'll give you your percentage. So on any given day, less than 1% of all shares actually available for this company trade on the New York Stock trade on the New York Stock Exchange and it's because overwhelmingly the vast majority of the shares are held at the top they're held at the top by the by the wealthy people who own all the corporations they own all the businesses there are only 10 businesses there are only 10 businesses in the entire uh, American economy that actually own everything in terms of food and beverage, the food and beverage industry is controlled by 10 businesses. That's it. Even though there are many different brands, there are only 10 companies that actually control all of that wealth. And so there's no diversity there at all. This is what you get with communism. In communism, these are the people who own all the assets, right? Overwhelmingly, these are the people that run the government. And they control all the assets. And what you get is socialism for the people. Anytime these people are going to take a loss, well, they just create inflation. And where does that inflation go? It goes right back to the top, right? As, as this article states, the top 10 to top 1%, excuse me, gained over $6.5 trillion in corporate equities and mutual funds as a result of the pandemic. So what was the goal of the pandemic? It was to drive people into poverty. That was the point, not just people within America, but also other countries, as those countries are then forced to create more inflation, therefore indebting them. And of course, Americans are able to get the products that they create that much cheaper. And so this is why when they say the economy is great, well, it is for them. It might not be for you, but from their standpoint, they're like, economy's never been better we've been stealing money left and right and this was the point of issuing all these jab mandates because all it did was it pulled money away from many of these countries what did the countries have to do right the jabs were quote-unquote free but for many of these countries they had to create their currency out of thin air to go and buy dollars to then buy the jab and so in essence what it does is it creates sort of a like back in the days you know like i i look at it from from age of empires and countries had to in essence pay tribute right you like if you remember like in all these different movies when they would visit the kings and they would bring them gifts right they'd bring you know silk or they'd bring animals rare animals or they'd bring you know a thing of gold or silver or pearls, right? It was a paying tribute. And in essence, that's what that was. But in a way where nations who wanted to remain loyal had to pay tribute in the form of a jab. And this is the same thing that goes on with the climate narrative. Countries that obey, they will be blessed. Countries that don't, well, they will be impoverished. And so you, what you get is a large, a small amount of people that control all of the assets at the top. And they control the governments. This is why you can see all the inflation that we have. And where people could say, are you telling me that all these 
businesses conspire together in food and beverage. And I'm like, shit, they're only 10. Ain't that difficult to conspire when you only got to worry about 10 corporations. And most of those have bodies. So how many people do you think that it takes for really to actually drive inflation in one direction or another? This is why you look at the stock market and overwhelmingly it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme where the poor people every single day, they drip money through their 401ks that they don't control. And they penalize you if you try to take your money out. You can't touch that money for the next 40, 50 years. And overwhelmingly what happens? Bit by bit, all that money slowly gets dripped into the stock market. And then these people, of course, sell you their shares at the top. And then they crash the market. And then they buy it back at the bottom. Rinse and repeat. Because all the liquidity is up here. All the liquidity is up here. So it doesn't take that much liquidity to move the, the, the market because there are only so few shares that are available. This is why Bitcoin has these big wild swings because overwhelmingly most Bitcoin is held in the hand of very few holders. And so it doesn't take that much liquidity to see these huge spikes. This is why the stock market is easily manipulated and why you see the stock market despite all the liquidity, everything that's go, all the bad stuff that's going on. It doesn't matter because the real liquidity is at the top, right? It's at the top here. Top 10% hold 90% of all shares. Why would they sell? What reason do they have to sell when they know that inflation is coming? They know inflation is coming. No reason for them to sell. This is why the stock market hasn't collapsed because they hold all the assets. They own everything at the top. The people, the only time that they sell is when they sell to you after they've created all the inflation and then they rip the market down because they can just drive it down because they hold all the all the liquidity they hold all the liquidity and of course this is run by by companies like BlackRock and by companies like uh, Vanguard and those companies control something like 15 trillion in wealth within the United States not just within the United States and overwhelmingly a lot of that money is from hedge funds, 401ks, etc. And so they control where that money goes. And when they need to pull that money away, and the bottom comes out, these people aren't worried. The people up here, they're not selling. There may be fluctuations within the market, but overwhelmingly they know at the end of the day, the market is going to move higher because we are going to create inflation. And much of that inflation will enter into the stock market and will just continue to enrich us. And this is how the economy has worked for a very long time. Longer than I've been alive, probably longer than, than, than you have been alive, probably longer than our parents have been alive. It, it, this, is how, this is how it's worked. And it's not changing anytime soon. The only way that you see stuff like this change is through a revolution. Where the let them eat cake sort of experience comes and then the people revolt. And all these people die. It is what it is. This is the re this is our reality, and this is why the dollar is not going to go anywhere. If anything, what we will see is we will see more poverty for the people, and especially for nations abroad.